Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us at Kelly for the Arc Flash Low Voltage Products webinar. Today we're going to go ahead and share some general information about Arc Flash and how it applies to control contractors. Obviously, in any organization, safety is first, and Arc Flash continues to be a bigger subject um, discussion for more and more um, organizations where they want to make sure that they're putting the right provisions in place to protect against arc flash incidents. Today I'm joined by Steve Zabatowski, who's a product manager with ABB. Steve, thank you so much for joining Kelly today, and I appreciate you sharing your knowledge on this subject. We're going to go ahead. We've got about a solid 40 minutes worth of time, so what we would like to do is have people submit their questions as we go through the presentation. Um, where appropriate, we'll go ahead and answer those questions. And then, of course, at the end, if you want to submit some questions, we'll address those as well. So we probably will run a little bit over. Um, we've had a phenomenal response to this webinar. Obviously, it's something, it's a subject that's very important um, to a lot of the people that um, purchase products today through Kelly. And so we, um, we're glad to be able to bring this subject to you. If you have additional questions at the end of the presentation that have not been answered, please feel free to respond to me, Lisa Kisseldens, and my um, email address is included on the last slide. So again, Steve, uh, welcome and thank you for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Lisa. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, today we're going to talk about a, a couple of different topics. One is uh, what a little bit of the background of what uh, uh, Arc Flash is and where the standards are with it, and then also cover what uh, actually makes up an Arc Flash and how we, we can reduce it by design and uh, other means and how to identify it. And then uh, there's a, also a slide that has the reference material. <clears throat> So arc flash is uh, very uh, a very dangerous uh, um, function. I shouldn't say function, but uh, uh, accident when it happens. About 30% of the uh, hazards that are or electrical hazards that occur are arc flash. You hear people getting electrical shock, and I read in the paper the other day somebody got electrocuted. And I'm going, wait a second, how did he go to the hospital if he got electrocuted? So there's a lot of misnomers, you know, especially with the media and people that, that uh, do report these as to what an, an accident is, whether it's uh, uh, arc flash, electrocution, or electrical shock. And electrical shock, obviously, is, is the first step to the electrocution part. But arc flash can occur even without touching the um, actual circuit. So it propagates in a very fast uh, manner. It's milliseconds usually, and the temperature is very high. And what happens when an arc flash occurs, you'll see in this, uh, in this photograph, you see all these sparks that are there. That's actually molten metal that's coming out of the um, enclosure. So it could be the tool that's molting, melting. It could be the... Um, copper bus bar, it could be a copper conductor, it could be metal, you know, the steel that's in there as well. So there's a lot of material that comes out with an arc flash. I, there is a misnomer that uh, arc flash only occurs with medium and high voltage. And several years ago, I'd say about 15 years ago, that's what we thought, you know, in industry. And it was primarily people who dealt with medium voltage and high voltage that had to deal with arc flash. Unfortunately, a lot more occurs at the lower voltages because we don't take as many precautions. And so what's happened is, over the years, OSHA has, has kind of investigated some of these accidents and has actually come up with some guidelines for us to follow, as well as the uh, NFPA, and that's the National uh, Fire Protection Association. So. What I'm going to do uh, next is to talk a little bit about OSHA and and some of the standards and how they kind of tie together. Hey, and, Steve, before yes. you go on, um, I was just curious about, you know, for our, for our folks here, 
why is it so important for even a controls contractor who typically works in low voltage products, you know, 24 volts? Well, how is this even relevant to them? Why is this an important subject even for a controls contractor to be aware of? That is a very good question. Uh, OSHA actually recognizes voltages over 50 volts as hazardous voltage. And you can have an arc flash, depending on the amount of energy, even at 50 volts you can have a pretty substantial arc flash. Typically when you get into the 24 volt range, uh, that's limited by the transformer that's supplying the 24 volts. However, motors are typically not connected to 24 volts. So even though the contractors are dealing primarily with 24 volts in the control system, the actual motors are being turned by 240 or 480, uh, sometimes 120 even. Uh, so those voltages are higher and the amount of energy that's available through the uh, circuit protective device such as a fuse or circuit breaker is high enough to actually cause an arc flash. So what OSHA does is they actually set the requirements, the legal requirements for um, the safety. So they're saying that you have to provide a safe workplace and so on and so on. They don't tell you how to actually do it. And that's where standards like NFPA 70E come into play. And what 70E does is it provides some procedural recommendations on how to actually set up a program. And the program is basically uh, training, such as we're in right now, uh, to identify and make you aware of the fact that arc flash is important. The other part of it is is that it provides some guidelines, and OSHA actually uses those guidelines as the de facto requirements or standards. And that's how the OSHA part gets tied into NFPA 70E. Even though if you go to OSHA, the OSHA website, they, they reference some of the 70E requirements, but they don't come right out and say, no, you have to follow 70E. They have their own guidelines uh, that you have to follow. And part of that comes into play with the fact that the employer is actually responsible for providing a uh, workplace that's free from recognized hazards. And these hazards can be can cause death or serious injury. And the excerpt that I have here that's in quotes is actually out of the uh, OSHA regulation for general protection. Now, the OSHA is broken up into a couple of different areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of them is, you know, it provides information about electrical safety, which is 1910.300. Uh, and it also provides information about the lockout tagout requirements, which is 1910.147. Now, when we start talking standards and regulations and stuff, most people have their eyes rolling back, as I suspect you are right now. But what these really are saying is that you have to recognize that there are hazards that are related to the electrical part of it, and there's hazards that are related to the lockout tagout. Traditionally, when we talk lockout tagout, if you're talking to people that work on a, in a shop, they're talking about their equipment or their machine being locked out, not necessarily to go and work on it from an electrical standpoint. However, I think anybody that's done electrical work has, has looked at it and go, oh, it's not a big deal. It's only 120. It's only 240. I'll just work on it. I'll just be careful. And that's where you run into problems. You cannot be complacent. You do have to do the lockout, tagout, and uh, go through those procedures. It sounds like understanding that code is extremely important and something that should really be read and understood. That um, when you're talking about arc flash protection, it starts with that with that lockout, tagout requirement. Right, and most employers, what they do is they're not putting procedures in place to make our jobs more difficult. They're putting procedures in place to protect us in some cases from ourselves. We don't understand sometimes what the hazard may actually be. And what happens is when procedures are developed, it's usually done by an engineer or somebody understands the facility, understands how it operates, and then determines what procedure would provide the safest means of performing that work. 
And in the case of electrical hazards, it's really quite simple. You need to turn off the power to the equipment before you start working on it. And so that's what a lot of the a lot of the standards are predicated on that part of it. So the uh, National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, has developed a standard. It's called NFPA 70E. And this standard gets updated every uh, seven years, I think it is. Some of them are five, some are seven. I think this one's a seven-year standard. So every seven years, they go through and review what's been happening over the last seven years, what changes they need to make to the standard to be able to accommodate better um, the type of uh, protection that's afforded by that particular standard. Uh, this applies to all industries. There are some exceptions. For instance, utilities have their own rules that they have to follow. And utilities, typically, when you're working in, with utilities, um, all of us like our power on all the time. So utilities have to work with stuff that's energized, and they are not able to actually turn it off. Uh, so that's why the utilities have a special uh, requirement and special uh, instructions. And NFPA 70E actually provides uh, more descriptive or prescriptive language as to how to actually achieve and protect people from electrical shock hazards, arc flash, and arc blast hazards. Now, you're probably going, well, isn't NFPA 70 the National Electric Code? And so what's 70E? Well, yes. NFPA 70 is the National Electric Code. Uh, 70E is the requirement on the personnel or people who are actually working with that. Um, one of the other things that ties into this is that 70E identifies what the requirements are, but doesn't really tell you how to determine like the available fault currents and stuff like that, um, and also the available energy. And that's where IEEE 1584 comes into play. And it allows the engineers to actually do a calculation on the facility and determine the available fault current and the available energy that's, that's at a particular site. That then is, determines what type of protective equipment you need, what type of, um, um, and what level of protective equipment that you may need. And 70E is what's used a lot of times by OSHA when they come in and, and inspect a facility. They'll use the guidelines that are in 70E to determine if the facility is, if that in particular employer is meeting the requirements for OSHA. And that's how that part of the inspection is handled. So who's responsible for electrical safety? Well, first of all, there's two, two elements to this. One is the employer which is who all of us work for. The other one is the employee. So the first one I'm going to talk about, what is the employer responsible for? And that one is very difficult because every employer is different. And if you're a contractor going into a facility, you have to be aware of two things. One is that facility may actually have some requirements. So their employer may have some requirements for how to properly lock out, what the electrical hazards are, how to protect against uh, uh, arc flash, the proper PPE that's required. And then you as a contractor may also have requirements for your own employer. And what you have to look at when you go in there is, are their standards more stringent than the standards that we follow, or is it the opposite way around? And what you have to do is you actually have to follow the more stringent standards. Uh, each facility has certain requirements, and they be, may be more lax in one facility and one employer than another. And I know working with a field service, uh, an organiz a field service organization and responsible for the safety, that it was always our responsibility as an employer to provide that information and make sure that they were following our requirements at the minimum. And so that's the other thing that's, that's tricky with this employer-employee because the employer does actually change as when you're a contractor because you're going into different facilities. So they'll, the employer is responsible for providing training. So 
um, just like we're doing right now with this training, this may be part of a bigger scheme for a particular employer. It may be a contractor. It may be that when you're doing contract work for a company, that company has their own training program that they have to put all their contractors through. And so that's that's the tie-in between those two pieces as well. So this, this training and establishing the training, keeping records of it, is very important. The other part of it is uh, the proper PPE. Uh, traditionally, what what's happened with the construction industry is, oh, you have, you have to wear a hard hat, safety shoes, and glasses, sometimes hearing protection. Well, a lot of times the safety personnel don't understand what the electrical hazards are. And so they don't recognize that there's other um, PPE that's required when you start dealing with stuff you can't see like electricity. So that's why it's important to have that. The other part of it is is that if you're dealing with anything over 50 volts, you should be you should have access to or you should be using insulated tools and test equipment. And the reason for that is if you were to drop a, a tool into an energized uh, cabinet, and this happens all the time, so it's not uncommon that people do drop tools in, in enclosures. If there's part of that enclosure is not locked out, that tool now has a possibility of shorting out. And so not only does the insulated tool protect you as you're working on, you may be working on an energized circuit, it also protects you against arc flash because if it drops into a circuit, there's less probability that would actually short out uh, phase to phase or phase to ground. So it's important to have those pieces of, of the uh, tool set together. Now the second part of it is it's the employee's responsibility. This, what happens when OSHA comes in to investigate an accident, the first thing they look at is going to be the employer. I have done uh, training seminars on safety, equipment safety, and also on electrical safety uh, for a number of years. I've never ever heard of anybody saying as an employee that OSHA has cited them. But there is actually a provision in OSHA that allows them to cite the employee. But in every case that I've ever seen or been involved with, it's always the employer that's responsible for it, not the employee. But that doesn't alleviate us from, as employees, from understanding what's required and following the rules. Just because OSHA isn't going to cite us, a lot of employers actually put in force uh, strict requirements that you follow the, the safety rules that are in place. And I've even heard them being as strict as you get one strike and you're out. And so you violate the rule one time and you're gone. And that, that is the type of enforcement sometimes that, that's required to get employees to actually follow some of the uh, uh, hazards. The other thing is, as an employee, you have to be aware of what these hazards are. And, you know, as a product manager, I get into a lot of different facilities. And some facilities are very lax with things like safety glasses. Uh, I carry my own safety glasses just in case that happens because I only have two eyes, like everybody else. And you don't want to have something go wrong. The other thing is you got to make sure procedures are in place and that you're, you're understand them and you're following those practices and never assume that something is locked out. Uh, most accidents that happen, that's the assumption that was made, oh, this was already off or this machine, this equipment isn't working, you know, I don't have to worry about it and lo and behold, the accident occurs. The other thing is don't cut corners. Uh, I know there's been times like I've I do work on my own house, electrical work, and I'll be looking at, oh, i got to walk all the way to the basement to turn off the breaker. No, I'm not going to do that, and I'll catch myself, and that's like, no, you have to do that. Don't skip that step. Go and do it. Be methodical about it, and make sure that, that you're protecting yourself as you go through the process. If there's uh, PPE that's required, you make sure that you wear it. Uh, a lot of us don't like wearing hard hats, but unfortunately hard hats do protect you against more than just uh, falling objects. They will protect you against inadvertently touching 
uh, an energized circuit in a panel, for instance. It'll hit the hard hat first. They're designed to have a dielectric withstand. And so things like, as simple as that can actually protect you. I think it's so important to remember that, you know, as an employee, you know, that responsibility starts with you first. And, you know, like you mentioned at the very beginning, Steve, that this is not just about being electrocuted. You know, you get electrocuted, you die. This is about living and surviving a flash event that could be debilitating the rest of your life. You know, and making sure that you're aware of what you can do within, within your control as an employee. Correct. And that's why it's important to follow the rules and, and use the PPE and pay attention to what's going on. All right. Um, OSHA does recommend, actually, if you're working on a live line, they have some very strict standards with it, and they don't recommend it at all. And if you are, um, if you do have to work on a piece of equipment, which you do from time to time that can't be turned off. Either it creates an unsafe situation by turning it off or it's completely infeasible to do that. And that's when it, it becomes even more important that you follow all of the rules, that you have uh, proper protection. You've got more than one person working on this so that you're not trying to do this by yourself. you got another set of eyes paying attention to what's going on. But they do prefer that the lockout tagout be the first method. And that's not just putting your lock on. Usually they require tags in conjunction with that. Uh, each employer, like I said earlier, um, as a contractor going into a facility, you have to look at which requirement is more stringent. And a facility may not require tags on their locks, but your employer may. And so you just have to continue following that same requirement where you use both the lockout and the tag system. So the second principle is um, when you're working on a circuit, just be aware that, hey, this thing could be live, could be live at any time. Identify the power source. A lot of employers now or a lot of large facilities actually have gone through and they, they are uh, labeling all of the disconnect sources. So when you're look, working on a panel, it'll tell you this panel is energized from this source and it'll tell you where to go actually turn off that or disconnect that power. If not, there are devices that actually detect if power has been removed. And these are non-contact devices, so a lot of times you don't even have to open up an enclosure. You can just put it close to the enclosure and it'll tell you whether that enclosure still has power to it or not. Visual verification when possible. Sometimes uh, disconnect, you can't actually visually verify it. So you have to provide uh, another means. Confirm that it's locked out by taking a, a voltmeter to it, uh, some other type of volt sen voltage sensor, uh, and make sure that, uh, that that's in place. You also have to understand, is there something that can store energy? Uh, large inductors, capacitors, those types of things can actually store a fair amount of energy that can actually be harmful. And it may you may look at, oh, it's only 100 volts on there, but there may be enough energy to actually cause an arc flash if there's only, even with only 100 volts on a particular device. In the event that you do have to work on something live, uh, OSHA does require that you have some type of a permit system, and they call it an energized work permit. That's typically managed by the facility or your employer. And if your employer doesn't have a plan like that and you go into a facility that does, again, you have to go by the, the requirement that's more stringent. Uh, I would assume that a facility would have an energized work permit. And so before you start working on anything, make sure you get a work permit from them. That will indicate or should indicate where the emergency exits are, how to contact people. And you say, well, why do I need to know that if I know how to work on this stuff? Well, that's the first part of the plan is to identify where the emergency response is and how to, to obtain it. The second part of it is, okay, how do I lock this thing out? 
in case we do have to we do have an emergency how do I actually turn it off and that's the second part of it even though you're not going to turn it off you have to identify where that energy source is coming from uh, the other things that are in there is okay who's going to be working on it how much how many people are going to be exposed to this particular hazard uh, if it's and you should never work on live uh, circuits alone. You should always have somebody from the facility or somebody else from your company that's accompanying you uh, that's at a safe distance working with you in conjunction with this uh, uh, permit. And it's very important with this one, I can't stress this enough, don't cut corners and don't skip any steps because that's when you're working on live circuits that's where your mistakes and accidents are going to occur. Uh, always with P or with uh, energized circuits, you're going to require some PPE, and we'll talk about that in just a second here. How how that's actually um, identified. Okay, most of this now. I'm just going to pop these all up here. Uh, this is pretty much the, what I just talked about. Describe the work that you need to do justify why you have to do it in an energized state, summarize what hazards or risks that you have, determine what PPE you need, and plan for preventive access by unauthorized personnel. You have to make sure that people that are in the area, maybe passerbys, they don't get involved in the actual work that you're doing. Steve, we had a question from one of the attendees. Does the energized work permit apply to um, applications below 50 volts? It would not apply below 50 volts. Again, 50 volts is not considered hazardous or dangerous by OSHA. Uh, you should, uh, as a matter of practice, you should still treat it as, as if it were a higher voltage. Uh, but energized work permits on on 24 volt systems, 48 volt systems typically are not required. Thank you. All right, one of the biggest things with uh, electrical hazards are even though you may not touch it, like Lisa was saying at the beginning, uh, you may not come in actual contact with it, but you can have dangers for arc flash and and other hazards that are. Uh, identified. So what the standards allow for is they say, okay, if I'm within three and a half feet, and this is assuming 750 volt system or less, I have to be I have to be a qualified person. And OSHA defines a qualified person as somebody who's uh, understands what they're doing with that particular circuit. Typically, an electrician is considered a qualified. Uh, person and the engineer may not. Even myself, as I go and work on stuff, I don't consider myself a qualified person unless I've actually been trained on that piece of equipment. There's also a restricted approach boundary, which is a distance that's one foot or less where you actually need PPE. This may inc include gloves, it may include arc flash protection, uh, it may include special equipment, Lots of different things fall into that. Then the last area is within one inch. It's considered you're actually touching the circuit. And if you're working that close to something that's energized, you're going to have to have the um, proper PPE to actually work on that. And that would be the arc flash protection uh, down to a lot higher uh, energy level than what I've identified in this part of it, which is the uh, arc flash hazard, which is a boundary that's about four feet from the actual uh, hazard. So, anybody have any questions on this part? Well, actually, we do have a question um, that's a little interesting. Uh, one of the attendees posted, we have a sticker on a panel that states that it's 240 volt class one arc flash rating, and requires all sorts of protective gear. Then on a different panel, which is rated at 480 volt class, um, has zero um, protective requirements. Um, why would there be a difference when the 480 volt obviously is a um, higher voltage and that would not require anything but the 240 volt would? Why would there be a discrepancy? 
Okay, a uh, couple of things are probably going on. Without actually seeing this panel, I can't answer specifically, but from what it sounds is that the 240 volt panel may be an older panel that when you open it up, the hazard is right there. There may be bare wires or conductors inside the panel where the 480 volt panel may be designed more what we call finger safe so that when you open it up, there are no exposed conductors that you can actually touch. The other thing that may be in play here is that when you open the 240 volt panel, uh, you're exposed to a breaker or a fuse or some other device in there that can actually cause a very large arc if it were to uh, trip or fall. Uh, in the 480 volt panel, there may be a sub-panel, there may be an isolated area inside that panel that actually protects against an arc, arc flash hazard so that it would contain any arc flash that would occur inside that enclosure. The other part of it that comes into play is the amount of available energy. The 240 volt panel may actually have uh, a higher fault current available than the 480 volt panel. And so it's not just the voltage that comes into play, it's also the amount of current. And when you combine those two, that provides you the amount of energy and that, that determines what the um, uh, degree of protection that's required. Steve, on the slide that we just had up there, the bullseye, um, is this slide really just related to bare conductors only or does it apply to the air, this the boundaries within the working space itself, regardless of whether or not it's bare conductors? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the arc flash applies uh, regardless of whether you have a uh, bare conductor or not. What happens is with the arc flash is that if the conductors are not accessible, the probability of having an actual injury or an arc flash is reduced. But what you have to consider, you, you consider it as if it's not protected at all and then you're in that four foot boundary. So th the conductor, it may not just be a wire that's there, it may actually be a bus in a, in a, a motor control center for instance, it may be a, a bare conductor on a, a contactor, uh, it could be the uh, terminal lugs on a circuit breaker or a fusible disconnect, so there's a lot of things that uh, you have to be aware of. Okay, uh, dielectric gloves, if you're using uh, some type of a dielectric glove or it's, a lot of people refer to them as rubber gloves, uh, several years ago we didn't have a color code for them so you, you had to actually look at the side of it. You could tell then what voltage it was rated for. Now we actually use a color code on, on the gloves and we have a class associated with them. Uh, most of you that use a, uh, a dielectric glove today, it's going to be either red or beige. It's probably going to be a red because it's going to be a thousand volts or less. Uh, so that's one thing you have to consider as you're looking at this. The other colors are for higher voltages and you can see the actual voltage ratings here. The um, uh, one other thing on this one, I almost forgot. With these gloves, you should never use them without a protective uh, leather protective glove on top of them. And the reason for that is that you can have uh, frays of wire sticking out, little strands sticking out that could actually poke through. Uh, you could have sharp edges on the bus bar. There's uh, you know any myriad of, of issues that can relate to. Uh, cutting the glove or puncturing the glove itself. So the category that you had the question about actually applies to this right here. And so what this does is it identifies the uh, type of risk, and I can't remember, I thought that was a uh, class one, which, right. pardon? It was class one for the 240, 240. and zero for the 480. Right. Basically what this is, is this is identifying the arc flash hazard. And so if you look at the class one here, it's saying you have to have a flame retardant shirt and pants and or flame retardant coveralls. And in addition to the clothing, it also requires that you have a hard hat and you have leather shoes on. 
and so uh, and safety glasses, hearing protection. You know, it, it just lists out everything. What this does is this is telling you on the front of that panel before I open this panel, this is what I need to have on and be prepared. Uh, on the 480 volt, that was a, a risk hazard uh, category of zero. So when you open that panel, there's probably nothing in there that really uh, can cause a, a substantial arc flash, and it's reducing the amount of energy that would be available. So it, it drastically changes the approach distance. It uh, changes the type of uh, protective equipment that you have to have on uh, when you're you're working in that particular area. Um, the arc flash categories in the table, are they from um, NFPA 70? This is out of 70E, correct? Out of 70E, okay. Right. Yeah, and we're finding that you know I spend a little bit of time out of the field as well, and um, we're seeing that more and more where control tech technicians um, and contractors are being mandated to at a minimum wearing you know the gloves, the eye protection, the the requirements in risk zero, um, and cotton clothes. So um, you know again as a control contractor, you know taking taking at least the minimum standards and applying them to you um, is important. Right, and the flame retardant shirts are something that they're not exactly uh, uh, the most comfortable, but they're not uncomfortable to wear either. They typically are a heavier cotton material that's uh, treated with the flame retardant. Uh, they could also be a uh, Nomex type of uh, shirt. Uh, the same thing with the pants. A lot of times uh, employers will say you can wear jeans. They used to be an acceptable type of flame retardant. Uh, pant material because it's heavy enough that it won't ignite, but uh, now they've actually changed that requirement to require, uh, you know, a little bit more flame retardant uh, clothing. So the the other thing, and this panel example is is a very good one because it sounds like the 480 volt panel they've actually uh, uh, reduced the hazards by design. So what they've done is they've added some covers, barriers, probably internally. Uh, they may have actually added some remote monitoring, so you don't even have to open the enclosure uh, to uh, uh, to monitor what's going on with the particular circuit. Where the 240 volt circuit, it sounds like that was not uh, part of the uh, general practice. So uh, the remote monitoring is is uh, something that's very significant. I'll, you'll see that quite a bit, especially now with uh, HVAC. There's a lot of building automation that goes on, and you're able to monitor what the motor's doing, how much current it has, without actually going and clipping a uh, current meter or sticking a voltage meter in in the enclosure. So those types of things are very important, and, and it minimizes the exposure and it doesn't eliminate the hazard but it minimizes the exposure to the potential hazard and that's what's important with that uh, monitoring. The overcurrent protective devices, uh, adding fuses and circuit breakers, uh, it look, you look at how much time it takes to actually clear that fault, how much energy, the I squared T that's let through in a particular device those come into play uh, when you, when you actually look at how this all works, uh, you know, as to how much energy is available and what's actually needed to um, to uh, rate that particular panel. The other thing that facilities have done, and I've got a slide near the end here that goes in a little bit more detail on this, they'll add a high impedance grounding system, which if you have a short from uh, um, phase to ground, it actually will minimize, it won't eliminate, but it minimizes the amount of current that can actually flow back to uh, the source. And so that, that minimizes how much available energy uh, actually gets let through that, that circuit. So this is an example of some covers uh, to actually prevent inadvertent contact from a shock hazard. Uh, you can see that there was actually a cage designed here to put in front of the switch so that you would uh, not be able to get to any of the uh, circuits behind it. Uh, the other thing that it does is it prevents tools from falling into the enclosure. 
Uh, so if you're walking up there and you turn this thing, with the you have a screwdriver in your hand, and for whatever reason it slips out, it's not going to drop into the enclosure and uh, and actually cause a, uh, an arc flash. Uh, the enclosure may be designed with a uh, sub sub panel or a sub front. So when you open up the door, there may be another panel inside uh, that has some of the controls on it. Uh, that's another technique to actually keep. Uh, keep you from going in or needing having to go into the enclosure uh, to do uh, any of the work or monitoring. Where the overcurrent protective device comes into play and, and the selection of this is very important. Uh, this curve uh, provided by uh, uh, Busman uh, gives you some idea of what amount of energy is available. And this is uh, given a 50,000 or 50 kVA uh, short, how much time it actually takes uh, to clear that fault and what the peak current is. There's also another curve that's provided by uh, fuse and circuit breaker manufacturers that tells you the amount of energy that's let through. That's the I squared T curve. And so with looking at these, you can actually design and determine how much available fault current there is in a panel. So this is um, this is a, a non-current limiting breaker. Will typically let through a lot more current than a current limiting breaker, which is going to be more um, along the lines of this black curve or the yellow be somewhere in between there. It's not quite as fast as a class J fuse, but it's it's very close to uh, the amount of uh, let through current, which is the I peak, and also the uh, uh, energy. We did have a question about what an AFCI breaker is. Um, an our AFCI breaker is an arc fault circuit interrupting breaker. Arc fault's just a little bit different than when we start talking about arc flash. Typically, the arc fault requirements have to do with residential um, dwellings where the um, AFCI breaker would be installed in your home load center, for example, and it protects um, those systems that are upstream and downstream from there. The code requirements are limited to the um, bedroom and some wet areas and I believe kitchen. Um, but Steve, can you explain on that a little bit? Sure. The uh, uh, arc flash circuit interrupter is designed so that if somebody were to uh, break the wire, let's say the insulation on a lamp cord, for instance, that will actually cause an arc. And that arc can then create a fire. And so the arc, um, arc fault circuit interrupter actually will detect that arc because you'll get a peak current. And what it does is it reacts fast enough to trip that out so that you don't have enough energy to ignite uh, potential or ignition sources in that area. So that's why it was originally designed specifically. It was going to say just bedrooms. Then they expanded that a little bit in the National Electric Code to expand it and include living areas as well. Okay. Folks, we know that we're running a little bit long. We, I kind of anticipated this. I know that we said 40 minutes, but um, obviously a lot of content here, and we wanted to make sure that we um, adequately um, shared that information with you, um, certainly if you have to go. Um, the information will be available on our website. Um, please feel free to continue to submit your questions, and uh, we're going to um, keep uh, continuing with the presentation. We should be wrapped up pretty soon. Right. I think we uh, have about two more slides, and these are actually pretty quick. So th this one just talks about what's uh, what a bolted fault current is, and that's actually the amount of uh, available current that you would have in a particular system. And uh, this gives you some idea. The IE is the incidental energy. So we were talking about PPE requirements. This tells you how much PPE you actually need. And then the uh, number next to it, which is the FPB, uh, that's the uh, uh, flash protection boundary. So once you get within that boundary, that's where you need to have uh, uh, the arc flash protection. Uh, 
Uh, these are just talking about different um, fault trips and where, you know, different circuit breakers. Uh, it's it's actually more along the lines of like uh, coordination, um, uh, circuit protection coordination or, or fault protection. So, and as you go upstream, what ends up happening is these breakers get to be larger, and they tend to respond a little slower. So it takes a lot more energy to trip them. That's why you want to try to to uh, uh, have um, your coordination done properly. Uh, this is uh, we were ta I talked earlier about a high impedance grounding system. This is how it would actually be uh, implemented. So if a wrench were to drop across the uh, the circuit, you limit the amount of current that flows, uh, so you minimize the actual arc flash from that. And uh, there are several references out there. Obviously, uh, you know, a company like Busman has a lot of stuff. Uh, NFPA 70E is available. Uh, there's also uh, uh, information available from OSHA. Uh, but a lot of the stuff from OSHA, if you read 70E, you'll understand what OSHA is requiring a lot better. Uh, 70E is a little bit more widespread uh, usage. Uh, companies use that as their their reference book basically. So we're at a point now that uh, if you have any other questions, any additional questions, please post them and um, we'll try to answer them. Um, who is responsible for applying the correct arc flash label? Who designs them? The label itself is um, there are some standards that just basically says, you know, what type of PPE you need, what the arc flash potential is, what the approach boundaries are, what the voltage hazard is. Uh, the person who's responsible for applying them is the facility or the facility engineers. Uh, it may be in conjunction with the safety engineers in that facility, but it's really up to the facility to determine, you know, where they get applied, how they get applied, and uh, what what's done to actually implement the PPE that's required. If you go to a panel that is not rated, how would you, how would someone know what the rating, what rating is required? I would assume the worst case, um, until you actually verify that it's locked out uh, and there's no energy there, you have to assume the panel is fully energized and can have the maximum potential. Um, you, most facilities are not going to exceed 480 volts or 575. So you can assume that it's uh, 600 volts or less. Uh, you probably will know if that facility is at 480 or 600. And so you can assume that it's at 480 volts, for instance, in, in most US facilities. That's a good assumption. And until you open up the panel and actually make voltage measurements with your PPE on, by the way, um, you then can determine if there's any energy in the panel. If there's no energy in the panel, then you're back to uh, standard work practices. OK. Any more? Looks like that's it. Well, thank you very much for attending our webinar. And thank you, Steve, for the um, detailed presentation that you provided for us today. Hopefully, it was uh, better proven beneficial to all those who have attended. And uh, again, we, we're glad that you're able to attend the Kelly webinars that we host monthly. Um, next month, we're going to be doing a lighting uh, session. Um, at the end of the month, uh, I believe June 28th. So please keep your eyes open for invitations regarding that subject. Uh, for control contractors, integrating lighting is becoming more and more um, interesting and available to them. So hopefully we can offer some learning opportunities there. Um, have a great day, and again, thank you for attending. Thank you, Lisa.